and welcome to the Current Science and Technology Podcast from the Museum of Science in Boston. I'm your host, Corrine Tate, and every week we bring you interviews with guest researchers and our museum staff covering science and technology in depth. An exciting new area of research that has exploded in the last decade is two-dimensional materials, literally the thinnest materials ever discovered. Layers of single atoms or molecules that exhibit a range of startling quantum behaviors that could make them useful in everything from electronics to sensing to bioengineering and many more fields. Joining me today to talk about these novel two-dimensional materials is Dr. Stephen Richardson, Professor of Electrical Engineering at Howard University in Washington, D.C., who is part of the NSF Center for Integrated Quantum Materials, a research center that includes investigators from Harvard, MIT, and Howard University. Welcome, Professor Richardson. Thanks very much. So before we dive into your research on some of these 2D materials, I wanted to spend a moment talking about something else, teaching. I heard that you recently won a Faculty Senate's Exemplary Teaching Award at Howard. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you very much, Corinne. Can you tell us a little bit about the significance of this award for you and what teaching methods you find work really well in this kind of teaching and research environment? Well, I was very happy to be honored to be selected as an awardee for this particular recognition. And it came from my peers, faculty peers and student peers. I look at it as a way of recognizing years of contributing to the mission of generating, producing the next generation of scientists and engineers. I strongly feel that there's a strong connection between doing interesting state-of-the-art research on two-dimensional materials, but we also have to make sure that the next generation of students is out there and that we can excite them and let them know that science and engineering, these are interesting and important fields and they can make a contribution to this area when when they get older. What is it that got you interested in a career in science? Our parents raised us to be independent and essentially seek out whatever it is we wanted to do in life, and they were very supportive. Um, I clearly had great role models in terms of teachers. So one of the great joys I remember having during Christmas was getting a Gilbert chemistry set <laughs> and, and mixing up things and seeing what happens. How do you balance your research with teaching? Well, it's a good question. So again, I was fortunate to have a number of mentors who, in addition to being great researchers, they were also great teachers. And I think the two work hand in hand. So teaching is about letting students know about what we already know, and research is about finding out new things and contributing to the greater body of new knowledge. And if you're going to be a great teacher, you really need to know what's going on in terms of state of the art issues and new exciting fields. If you're going to be a great researcher, a lot of the skills that you need in teaching come into play also. So I don't look at it as an either or a proposition. If you're either a great teacher or a great researcher, I think you can be both and you need to be both. There's a, you know, there's a synergistic relationship between the two. So getting back to your research, these two-dimensional materials, they're, they're really making a splash in the material science world, and perhaps the most famous 2D material that some of our listeners may have heard of before is graphene. Can you tell us a little bit about what graphene is and what makes it so special? Well, sure. Well, we're all familiar with pencils. Unfortunately, or fortunately, that's not really lead in your pencil. And that's really a form of carbon known as graphite. Well, it turns out that the graphite is really a a stacked deck of two-dimensional layers of carbon. And one of those two-dimensional layers, that's That form of carbon, it's not graphite, it's graphene. So it's a two-dimensional sort of honeycomb-like structure. And because it's two-dimensional, the electrons in that material behave quite differently than they do in three dimensions. So before you go on, this is something that kind of I find really startling, that carbon, which is really common, and sure. you know the stuff in pencils we're sure. all familiar with, we don't think it's that special. Sure. But you're saying that when you get down to two dimensions, so just one atomic layer of carbon, all of a sudden it's more special? So we know that solids in general are made of atoms, and atoms are made of electrons and protons and, neut- and neutrons, or nuclei. 
And we run into problems when we try to figure out, well, what are these little particles doing? So if we try to use the Newton's equations of motion to figure out what electrons do inside any solid, we get ridiculously wrong answers. So we have spent, not we, but lots of folks in the last hundreds of years have spent a lot of time, energy, experiments, trying to figure out what do atoms actually do and how do they behave on, the, on a very small scale. And we, we, we believe we have a good model to explain how atoms work on a small scale. It's called quantum mechanics. So what you're saying is that the laws of motion that explain what happens at our size scale don't apply down at the atomic level. We need totally new rules to explain what's happening down there. Absolutely. And some people think these rules are spooky and strange and bizarre, <laughs> and they are. Okay, so we've established that 2D graphene follows kind of these new rules. But what exactly is so special? What does graphene do that graphite does not? Well, excellent question. First of all, two-dimensional graphene is extremely strong. So it's one of the strongest materials out there. And someone has done a calculation where you can imagine uh, putting an elephant on a piece of graphene and the graphene is just so strong that it would support the elephant's weight. It's also flexible because it's like a sheet of paper. You can bend it, you can distort it. That's important because you can use it to make new devices. It also, because of its two-dimensionality, the electrons in graphene, unlike the electrons in graphite, move extremely fast. It's important because if we're going to make faster computers, and if we're going to make the next generation of an iPhone, I don't know, iPhone 55, <laughs> we need to have materials that conduct electricity at record speeds so that they can act as switches and devices. So the fact that these electrons move at fast speeds is something we can exploit. So to summarize, graphene is pretty amazing because not only is it incredibly thin, super strong, and super flexible, but it's it has this amazing electrical conductivity at this very high speed. So yeah. one of the things that we can use it for is new electronic devices like the next iPhone or sure. things like that. I can see why researchers got so excited about graphene. It sounds like a wonder material, but it does have limitations. So graphene conducts electricity, and it conducts, it, it conducts electricity very well. So the electrons move inside this two-dimensional sheet of graphene at very fa fast speeds. So that's a good thing. But if you want to make a device like a transistor, so deep down inside of all of these devices, an iPhone, an iPad, an iMac, a cell phone, a TV, there are transistors made of silicon. And these transistors are switches. They have the ability to conduct electrical current and turn off electrical current. They can store information in terms of ones and zeros yes and no, up and down, binary. And all of these devices in communication or computing share that common feature. So if all our computers and computing devices are really made of these little switches, I start seeing the problem with graphene. It sounds really promising, but you said it conducts electricity amazingly well. How are you gonna turn it off? Well, good question. Well, let's go back to silicon. So we've got I guess the iPhone 6 Plus is the latest thing to hit the streets. And that uses silicon as the basis of it, is the switch. Well, we know that we always are trying to build faster computers and better cell phones. But it turns out there's a law called Moore's Law that says there's a limit to how fast we're going to make machines or supercomputers that work at certain speeds and what the next generation iPhone is going to look like. And the sad thing is that that limit is probably in the next 10 to 20 years. So the semiconductor industry is starting to get a little scared because they realize that we've had a marvelous relationship with silicon for 50 years, but we've got to look at new materials 
to make these switches out of. So graphene, there's so, been so much excitement about graphene because it's a potential material that people could use to replace silicon. Problem with graphene is that, as we talked about earlier, it's an excellent uh, conductor of electricity. So it's naturally not a switch. So people are trying to figure out ways to turn graphene into a semiconductor, and that's one line of research. Another line of research is to come up with new materials beyond graphene that are two-dimensional, that have this nice characteristic of being very flexible, being very strong, but can function as switches that can have two states, conduct electricity, don't conduct electricity. And that's how you build a device, a faster computer or a faster cell phone. So can you give me an example of, of one of these or some of these materials beyond graphene? So if you look at the periodic table of elements, you see carbon. Carbon has six electrons. Well, underneath carbon in the periodic table is silicon. And she has 14 electrons. And because it's right underneath carbon, it should have the same type of properties that carbon has, but with maybe some subtleties. Underneath silicon is germanium. He has 32 electrons. So two-dimensional graphene, which is made of carbon, is not going to help us make these better, faster devices because it's not a semiconductor. But if you replace all the carbon atoms by germanium atoms, an interesting thing happens. Those materials, a two-dimensional sheet of just germanium atoms, that material does function as a semiconductor, and you can make devices out of it. So you said carbon, when you have a single layer of carbon atoms, it conducts electricity amazingly well. Yes. When you have silicon, which is one level down in the periodic table, you said it's a semiconductor. We can switch it on and off, and that's the basis for our, our computing. Right. And below that is germanium. Yep. So you're saying germanium is more like a semiconductor, more like silicon than carbon, Absolutely. which is that Absolutely. great electrical conductor. What's new is we're going to take silicon and germanium and make two-dimensional materials out of that, and that's going to be a new class of quantum materials in addition to graphene. So what does your research have to do with making these two-dimensional materials? Are you making them? Are you trying to understand them? What do you do with it? I do calculations. I use com supercomputers to do com experiments on computers. So I don't go into a laboratory and actually mix things together, <laughs> and I don't pull out a toolkit and make a device. What I do is use supercomputers to calculate the properties of these materials, where the atoms should be, what the most stable geometry or arrangement in space of what the atom should be. What are their vibrational properties? What happens to these materials when you expose them to light or radiation? Turns out they vibrate, and they vibrate with a unique fingerprint, a unique vibrational uh, signature. And these are all questions that you can answer experimentally, but you can also answer these questions by doing calculations. And there are some times where there are problems that you just can't measure in a lab, the properties of these materials. You have to go out and actually calculate them using these supercomputers and using these mysterious, spooky laws of quantum mechanics, which actually work. So what do you think is most exciting then about germanium? A two-dimensional layer of germanium is germanine. And germanine is a new two-dimensional quantum material, but... Unlike graphene, it's easily usable for devices. Now, w to be honest, we're just starting to discover ways to make devices out of germanine. But you have to start somewhere. The transistor, that came out of discovering basic properties of how electrons behave in solids. And nobody had any idea that we were going to use the ideas of a transistor to revolutionize or create a new industry called the electronics industry. And that's what's happened. So these quantum materials in two dimensions, they're going to lead us to the next generation of technologies. What's exciting is we don't know what's behind the curtain yet. <laughs> but we have to at least understand these materials 
from a fundamental basic point of view. And I probably won't be around to see how these materials will actually translate into real devices, applications down the road. But the next generation of scientists and engineers will. That's a really, a really interesting idea that we think it's going to be useful in electronics, but we can't necessarily predict exactly how it's going to be used. Sure. Uh, because that was going to be some of my questions sure. to you, or what, sure. what are these big applications? Sure. And you're saying that the truth is we don't really know yet. It turns out that these new materials, because of their structure, because of their flexibility, because of their electronic properties, they are going to allow us to make faster devices, faster supercomputers, and better cell phones. So we talked a little bit about graphene, the carbon-based two-dimensional layer, and germanine, the two-dimensional germanium-based layer. But there's a lot more out there, aren't there? Oh, absolutely. So you can make a two-dimensional uh, quantum material out of boron and nitrogen where the atoms are arranged in a hexagon. So you're alternating boron, nitrogen, boron, nitrogen. This is called hexagonal boron nitride. The electronic properties of this material are such that this material is an insulator. It doesn't conduct electricity. If you look throughout the periodic table and grab molybdenum and sulfur, you can make a new two-dimensional quantum material called molybdenum disulfide, and that material is a semiconductor. So not all two-dimensional materials behave the same way. We have amazing electrical conductors, we have insulators, and we have semiconductors. And, and there's more to the party. We can take those three materials and we can form layers or sandwiches of them. And by doing this, we can tailor these materials to make devices that have even more fascinating electrical and optical properties. That's important because the scientists and engineers all over the globe will take these materials, make new devices out of them that hopefully will yield faster computers and better communication devices. Well, that sounds very exciting. These two-dimensional materials, first of all, there's so many of them. They have so many different properties and they have so much promise for electronics, and I understand a lot of other fields as well. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Professor Richardson. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. That's it for this week's show, but be sure to come back next time for more of the latest in science and technology. This podcast is a production of Current Science and Technology at the Museum of Science in Boston, part of the Boston community for over 175 years. For more information, visit our website at www.mos.org slash podcasts or email us at podcast at mos.org. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.